Heavenly Father, God, we come before you, and we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to receive that which you have for us today. Lord, as we study this letter, this letter that was written to Jewish believers, to new converts from that which they had known to that which you had made known through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, may it be that as we would be witnesses to what they were going through, Lord, we would see also what your purpose and plan is for us. And so, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In verse 1 of chapter 10, we read, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things. Now, I went back for the express purpose of being able to talk about how it is that the law was a shadow of good things to come. And we know that this shadow was none other than of Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfilled the law and provided what the law could never provide. Listen, Jesus has given us complete and unhindered access to God the Father. With this in mind, then the writer declares, and he brings forth his point in verse 19. That's what the therefore is there for. And it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil, that is, His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. You see, because what Jesus has done, we can enter into the Holy of Holies. We can go in through a new and a living way. Now, it's interesting because the earthly priest, you know, the, the Levitical priest, the high priest, could only go into the presence of God one day a year for a very limited time. He was the only one of all the people that was allowed to be in the presence of God. And what the writer is telling us here is we now have the ability, an open invitation, to go into the presence of God any time we want. Amen! I mean, that's an amazing thing. We don't have to wait for it. We don't have to have somebody else do it for us. We have the ability right now, right here where you are, where I am, to be able to enter into the Holy of Holies, the presence of God Almighty. And we have to understand, we don't have to live separate from this holy place. We never need to leave the presence of the Lord. And here's an amazing thought. Now think about this for a minute. What if we just went into the Holy of Holies? And you know, we've talked about the temple and we've talked about what it was like. You would come into the courtyard and you would go into the holy place and you would go past the altar, you would go past the showbread, you would go past the incense and into the Holy of Holies. And only that reserved for the high priest until Jesus made it available to us. But what if, what if we went in and refused to come out? I mean, what if we just went into the presence of the Lord? What if we went in and we didn't allow anymore the enemy to accuse and have access to our lives? What if we never left the mercy seat? What if we just stayed right there next to the mercy seat of God? What if we continually stayed in this holiest place in the presence of God? Now, I don't know about you, but it seems like a good idea. And it makes sense. The question is, is it really possible? I mean, is, is it really possible to continually be in the presence of God? And from what I see in Scripture here, since Jesus has completed the work, since Jesus has made a way for us to enter in, that, that there's no reason why we can't just hang out in the presence of God all the time. All the time. But I think something holds us back. And I think what holds us back is we have a tendency to treat our relationship with God, treating the presence of God in our lives or being in God's presence more like a vacation than a permanent residency. Stay with me. I love vacations. Is anybody in here not like vacations? Well, I'm not saying they're not work, but they're vacations. I like even the word. To vacation is to vacate. Profound, isn't it? What are we vacating? Well, we're vacating things like, well, the mundane, the common, the stressful, the unrestful, the 
hassles of life, the things that come against us. So we're vacating the things that come against us in favor for the things, well, that we want to do. The things that we like. For me, uh, the beaches of the west coast of Florida. A specific beach that's on a little island called Anna Maria Island. And the island's not all that big and the beaches are not all that spectacular, but they're pristine and they're comfortable. And as I walk through the swirling waves with the sun beating on my face and <laughs> the water in the bay at 80 degrees, like a bath water inviting you. <sighs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I was there. I, I, was, I was there. I'll, I'll, I'll come back now. If I would, if I could, I'd stay. When I'm there, I would. But in reality, just the nature of vacations are that they're just for a while. I can only stay on the beach for a short time because, well, they're expensive to go on vacation. How many of you have noticed that? All right. I wish I could vacate the cost. They're meant to get us through the year by having a distraction for a period of time. And unless you are extremely wealthy or well-heeled or, or more fortunate than I, well, it's only going to be a temporary thing. A few years ago, there was a commercial for a cruise line where a guy referred to his normal and his work life as a temporary exile in between his cruises. <laughs> I wish it was so, but the reality is, is it's more like the other way. We have a temporary distraction from what is the continual aspect of this life and i think that this is where so many of us miss the invitation of our lord to stay in the place of peace and the place of rest the place of perfection known as the presence of the lord you see we may visit it we may go to it from time to time but i think the same approach that we have towards vacations very often we have towards the presence of the lord it's too expensive to stay there it costs us something to stay in the presence of the Lord. It costs us, well, it costs us the things in our life that we work so hard for. Like being aggravated with our job. Some of us work really, really hard to be aggravated with our jobs. We would have to give that up. Some of us work really, really hard to strive after possessions and for the things that we want to amass and that we want to accumulate. But the reality is, is in order to stay in the presence of the Lord, we would have to be willing to see those as not a release from the Lord, but a blessing by which we then get to enjoy them, but not as much as we would enjoy being in His presence. Oh, there's times when we would have to give up. Well, even the things that we count as so worthy, but really have no value at all. It's not really a place that we stay, this presence of the Lord. It's a place that we visit. It's a place that we go to from time to time. And for some, I'm afraid that it's even a place that is kind of like that dream vacation they hope to get to someday. But guys, understand, there is no cost to be in the presence of the Lord because Jesus Christ has paid the price. The price has already been paid. It's paid in full. And our name is written in the registry, literally, as a permanent residence. A permanent inhabitant of the presence of the Lord. We can live every day choosing to enjoy the Lord and what He has for us, not just be one that checks in from time to time. And see, I don't ever want it to be that, that your experience here at church is that mini vacation from life. And sometimes that's how we see it. Well, I've got to deal with, with my life from Monday to Wednesday, and then Wednesday night I get to go to church and I get a little vacation and I get to worship with the Lord. And then I've got Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But then Sunday's coming, and when I get there on Sunday, I get to have this, this time of refreshing and this time... You know what, guys? God doesn't want us coming into His presence as if it's some sort of vacation from life. It's not His intent. It's not His purpose. And it's not for that which Jesus died. I can get up every morning and I can say, Lord, I choose to follow You. I choose to seek after the things of Jesus Christ. I choose to live in Your presence. And here's the neat thing. 
Psalm 16, 11 says that he will show his path of life to us. And in his presence, listen, is the fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now let me ask you a question. Today is Sunday, and you may have woke up and had joy because you were going to church. And you may have thought of the pleasures that you're going to have by seeing all the folks that you love and having this wonderful time of fellowship. But how many of you think that that'll be your experience at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning? I got one. See, a couple of you. A few of you are thinking, uh, Monday. Mondays, why, is, why do we dread Monday? I mean, I see the bumper stickers, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. But see, the idea, the reality is, is that we get to go into this place of the presence of God. And we can live in that presence, but the question becomes, how do we accomplish it? Look at verse 22. Let us draw nearer with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Say amen. You see, the key to living in the presence of the Lord is drawing near to the Lord. You know what's even more amazing about it is the Scripture promises and the Lord Himself promises that if we will draw near to Him, that He'll draw near to us. That it's, it's a matter of us moving in His direction only to find that He's moving in our direction. It's not something that we have to chase after. It's something we simply have to turn to. We have to draw near. And if we draw near, then He promises to draw near to us and as we keep our minds and our hearts turned towards Christ what we'll find is we'll find ourselves moving in what the author is describing as a new way of living it's a new way it's a, it's a new kind of living it's a new perspective it's a it's a new aspect of our understanding of who we are in Christ Jesus we're not just in where we are based on no purpose this new way is based on having full assurance in our faith, holding fast to Jesus. And it's a process, listen, it's a process to which we apply ourselves. It's not something that just happens. It's not something that just happens. If we want to live in the presence of the Lord, then we need to practice the presence of the Lord. You see, a lot of times when folks come to the Lord they think that somehow or another that just by virtue of recognizing that he exists is somehow or another that that's going to perfect their relationship with him how many of you have found that to be true that just by knowing him it perfects your relationship so just by knowing your spouse without spending any time or without taking any effort to get to know the people that you love your relationship just blossoms and flourishes right no there has to be this process by which we put ourselves into the practice of being within the presence of the Lord. Think about it this way. We live our lives based on the influences that come to us in our lives. Our life in the world is driven by the things that happen, by the circumstances that we find ourselves in. So because we are constantly in the world, the world is ever-present and around us. Isn't that profound? I sit up all night thinking about that one. So what I'm telling you is, is that because we live in the world, that we're present in the world. Wow. Deep stuff, huh? You thought that this was all just going to be superficial dribble. This is deep. It's profound. Somebody say, what's your point, Pastor? Well, here's the point. If we want to be in the presence of the Lord, we need to make, listen, we need to make Jesus Christ our life, not just a part of our life i talk to a lot of people that will say without any hesitation oh jesus is a really big part of my life oh my faith is a big part of my life which means that at some point in time life is is bigger because this is a contributing factor but it's not necessarily who we are and what we need to say is we need to say that jesus is my life and all of the other things take up a part you see, we've got to turn. This is that new way of living. It's that new way of thinking. It's that, that understanding that we're no longer going through this life 
and having a small portion of Jesus, Jesus is our life, and that which comes against us is small compared to Him. Everything changes when we change focus. All of a sudden, the job that was so overwhelming, oh, it's important. We need to eat. We've got to keep, we've got to keep provision. But rather than it becoming so overwhelming that it seems to outshadow Jesus, it becomes just a small part of who we are in Him. That relationship that we struggle with, or the possessions that we have, instead of them being something that keeps us from Him, it becomes an opportunity and a blessing from Him. The problems that we have, <laughs> they become opportunities. They become opportunities to see and to watch God move in our lives. And we talked last week, we talked about how in the midst of of trial and in the midst of tribulation in the midst of problems when God is moving is when we see the good and all things work together for good for those who love the Lord oh we talked about how it's not a matter of all things being good but as we see God move in our lives it can't help but be for our good some might say well pastor you're just practicing some sort of creating creative avoidance or problem avoidance by just checking out of reality i mean the reality is is that we live in the world and we have to rely on god just to get by because i can't even breathe without him well i don't think so i don't see that here i'm i'm seeing what what is a different a new way of living a new reality that was brought to us by jesus christ and as we live in the promises of god it says i can hold fast the confession of my hope without wavering because I'm so strong? No. Because he who promised it is faithful. Because he's faithful. Guys, we can practice living in the presence, not just vacationing there. We can live in the Holy of Holies every day because Jesus has paid the price to make us permanent residents. This world, it's what's temporary, it's the temporary exile. Our dwelling place, our permanent place, is in the presence of our Lord. Look at what it says in verse 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. This is that hope that I have for the line on my tombstone or to be put into my obituary is that Gary considered others and he stirred them up to love and to good works more often I'm thinking it's going to read Gary just stirred things up <laughs> but we're supposed to be a blessing to one another encouraging and building each other up stirring up love and good works we're to be those who come together in fellowship, hoping the best and believing the best and thinking the best and wanting the best and doing the best for each other, having a good word to say about each other, encouraging. You've heard me say this before, that if you find yourself talking about someone in a negative way or you find yourself talking about someone more than you're talking to someone, then you're not doing what God has called you to do. Oh, and we all do it. What's amazing is we'll even do it here in church that's not right imagine a place if you will imagine a place where you could come with the intent of promoting love and encouraging others not only that but a place where you in turn would receive love and encouragement imagine if that place existed you know what it is This is it. It's the church of Jesus Christ. It's the place that we come together. The writer is talking to a group of believers. He's talking to the churches. He's talking to those that are in Christ Jesus. And he says, and I want you to come together and stir up love. Stir it up. It's not a passive 
implication. To stir up love and to stir up good works. Here's the thing, if we're practicing living in the presence of the Lord, dwelling in the Holy of Holies, we're going to want others to have the same. We're going to want others to have that presence of, the, of God in their life, that peace that comes from it, and we're going to help to promote that within each other. And that's the goal, that's the purpose of the church. It's the reason, one of the reasons that we gather, one of the main reasons is to continually encourage each other in the things of the Lord. This is assembling ourselves together, exhorting one another so much more as we see the day approaching. Is anybody in here willing to argue with me that we are closer to the Lord's return than we have been in any other time in history? Okay. Because we know Jesus is coming soon. We're supposed to be those who are listening. Listen, continually coming together and exhorting and encouraging each other in the things of the Lord. This ought to be, you know, they, they, they say that Disneyland is the happiest place on earth. I ain't buying it. This should be the happiest place on earth. This should be the place where people come with the expectation of spurring each other on with the end goal to be in the presence of God, to be living in the victory of God, to be living in a place of empowerment through His Holy Spirit to change the world that's around us. And every single one of us here should come with the intent of being a vehicle by which people would arrive there and for us, if we needed, a place where we can jump on board and we can go with them. That's what this is about. That's what the author is writing and sharing and what's being encouraged here. Unfortunately, there's times when, again, I just feel like I'm stirring stuff up. It's a whole lot easier to point out the negative than it is to be looking at the good stuff. Oh, now, more recently, since last month, there's been less complaining after that little election thing. But boy, we were just stirring it up before that, weren't we? You see, now we might be stirring it up and thinking, oh, this is good. It's good now. It wasn't good then. What made it not good then? Was God not on the throne? Were we not in the presence of the Lord? Were we not able to stand every day in His presence in the Holy of Holy in peace and perfect communion with God before a date on a calendar? Oh. Well, we were stirring something up before that, though, weren't we? You see, we have a choice. It says that if we consider others, we stir up love and good works. What an amazing concept. I guess that means that if I'm not considering others, if I'm just considering myself, then the things that I'm going to stir up are not going to be so good. Pride and selfishness will always lead to the pointing out of faults in others in the world around us. It will. When we're prideful, when we're not considering others, it's going to be really easy to find things that are wrong. As long as I'm focused on myself, I'm going to see what's coming against me. But as soon as I, as I turn my focus on meeting of the needs of other people, as soon as I put your needs and, and my desire for you to be in the presence of the Lord before my own, I'm going to see that the problems that I have become very minuscule. You know, one of the things that we talk about in relationship to feeling better about our situation is just to recognize that someone else always has it worse, right? You ever played that game? I was talking to somebody at one of the stores the other day when we were picking up some things that we needed for the house, and, and they were talking about how they were having such a rough day, and it was just, oh, they were tired all the time. And, you know, and I always let somebody just kind of kind of go on and on and on and, and so about halfway through the process of this conversation of them just being so tired and 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 not wanting to be at work and everything else they said well, well what are you doing with all of this stuff that i was getting and i said well we had a water bright pipe break in the house and flooded the whole house out and all the carpet's gone and tile and we're having to gut everything and they went wow <laughs> that really stinks right over the holidays doesn't it I said, well, you know, it's all right. It's going to be great when it's all back together. It's going to be okay. It's going to be good. And, 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 they, and they, just, they just paused, and they, and they just went, I guess I really don't have anything to complain about. I said, 
I said, me neither. I said, me neither. That's not what this is talking about. In this idea of considering others, it's not saying compare ourselves to others who have it worse so that we feel better about ourselves. That's not what this is saying. We do that. What this is saying is to put their needs ahead of ours. Consider their position and do what you can to make it better in the things of the Lord. Put their needs and their comfort above your own. This is hard for me because I'm basically at my nature a very selfish person. (laughs) I didn't need an amen on that. You all were waiting. Some of you were waiting for it. You're like, okay, she's going to say something up there. And the only reason that you can agree with me and my selfishness is because you're just as selfish as I am. I mean, we are. And yet the key to stirring up this goodness, the key to being in the presence of God is putting the needs of others before our own. Something happens, man. Something snaps. Something changes. When all of a sudden we recognize that we can place and give the goodness of God to someone else, it puts that goodness in our hearts and it fills us to overflowing to the point that we then become the vehicle by which He pours out. Rather than running around and saying, Lord, fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me. We're like, Lord, you got to stop. As the apostle said, I can't take any more. This is so good. you got to slow down. you got to stop. And at the same time, hoping that he never does. We can live in the presence of the Lord. We can trust in his promises. And we can literally stir up love and good works. Verse 26 says, For if... We sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth. There's no longer remaining a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses, how, of how much more worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified as a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And we are just cruising right along. This whole concept of a better priesthood, a better promise, a better sanctuary, living in the presence of God, stirring up love and good works, and all of a sudden, it seems like the writer just turns an about face and drops a bomb on us. It would appear that what he said is he's, he's wiped out all hope for anybody who comes to know Christ and then would sin again because he says there's no sacrifice available for that. It makes it look like if we come to know Christ and we mess up that we can lose our salvation, that we can lose our position and our place with Christ. But guys, that's not what it says. Well, it looks like it. The first thing that we've got to do is we've got to keep this in context of who it's being written to. Well, you remember the title of this book, Hebrews, which means it's being written to Hebrews. Now, the point, the purpose... Is being written to those who have come to know Jesus Christ who are now thinking that they need to go back to the law in order to perfect that which Jesus Christ has put. When we put it in that kind of context, the idea of moving back to that which couldn't save, away from that which was perfected in salvation, makes no sense. And yeah, it's trampling that which Jesus has done underfoot. It's taking away and saying that somehow or another what Jesus Christ did was not sufficient if we try to add to it. You see, there's nothing that we can bring, there's nothing that we can add which would make the sacrifice of Jesus Christ more perfect. It serves for us as a warning against that specifically, that we would try in some way or another to bring along with the sacrifice of Christ something of our own in order to add to it. 
And contrary to many well-intentioned pastors and many well-intentioned service sermons, this warning in Hebrews 10, listen, guys, it's not a reference to those who fall back into sin, losing their ability to be restored to God. If that was the case, we would have no grace. If that was the case, then Jesus' sacrifice truly would not have been sufficient. And I know that even as I look out there right now, some of you have heard this verse preached that way, haven't you? Oh, man. Trample in the blood of Christ underfoot. If you sin, you're not going to... It's not what it says. It's not in the nature of God. It's not the grace of God that He's bestowed on us. Now, can sin separate us from God? Is sin a terrible thing in our life? Unrepentant sin especially? Absolutely. But this doesn't say that if you sin after you become a Christian, you lose your salvation or your ability to be able to approach God and dwell in that place of perfection with Him in the Holy of Holies. It's not what it says. Talking to the Hebrews, if you go back to that which couldn't save over that which could and you choose that, you're blowing it. True statement. And you know what for us? If we try to add to the things and to the finished work of Jesus Christ, we are going to find ourselves in a place of futility. Amen? So understand what it says. so important that we let Scripture interpret Scripture. That we don't take a segment of Scripture and, and create some sort of theological or doctor, doctrinal thought or concept based on something that is not within the context of what the author and what God meant for this to say. And there's been some that have. And so I want you to know, if that's how you received this verse in the past, go read the whole chapter. Don't just read those few verses. But yet at the same time, listen, the author's right. It is a terrible thing to fall into the nail-pierced hands of a living God if we're coming into those hands with a sacrifice other than that which Jesus Christ perfected. Verse 32, before or but recall... The former days in which you were illuminated, you endured great struggles with suffering, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were also treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyful, joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourself in heaven. This is one of the reasons, and I know that we didn't make a big deal out of this, and I still don't want to. It's one of the reasons that I think Paul's the author of this. It's very much so like Paul to refer to his chains for the gospel, because Paul was in chains for the gospel. So again, I'm not making a, a doctrinal position on this, but my leaning is that I still believe that Paul is the writer of this letter. You get to make up your own mind. If you want to be wrong, go right ahead. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Not. Okay. It's interesting what this brings up, though, and I wish it wasn't so, but as we come alive to the Spirit of God, as we receive and accept Jesus Christ in our lives, what happens is, is that we are then instantly marked. It's like an alarm goes off, a beacon that would indicate to Satan that we are now worthy of attack. Now, here's the thing. We may have been afflicted before we came to know Christ, but most of our affliction was because of our own deprivation. Satan was not concerned or worried about our impact on the world before we came to know Jesus Christ. I think he was more so amused by our own tendency for self-destruction. I think he would sit back and watch and occasionally kick a rock in our path just to see us trip and stumble and fall. But it wasn't until we received, by the grace of God, salvation through Jesus Christ that we became a threat for the enemy. We become a legitimate threat. And what winds up happening is so often the, those that come to the Lord who are new in the Lord, not unlike a young animal that's born on the Serengeti and we've all seen Mutual of Omaha or one of these nature shows to where you're rooting for the little baby wildebeest, but you know it's not going to make it. <laughs> the lions are drawing close and they're pulling in. 
And as much as the other wildebeest try to outrun the lion, the little one just can't get away because it's too slow, it's too immature, it's so much of a baby it can't survive, and it's taken out by the lion. The enemy loves to attack new Christians the same way. The enemy loves to put them in his sights and to see them as weak, and it's one of the main reasons why it is that we are so encouraged to gather in fellowship and not forsake encouraging one another because, first off, there's safety in numbers. Now, when I talk about those that are new, I'm not saying that anybody in here, based on where you are with the Lord and how many years that you've walked with the Lord, can defend yourself individually against that lion any better than a new Christian. And you know what I'm talking about. When we get out there on our own and we get separated from the things of God and from the people of God, we become just as vulnerable as if we have had, had no experience whatsoever if we have separated our things from God. And the enemy loves to just come and pounce. And you know what? He loves to take out what would be considered mature Christians. Loves to take down one of those that's just kind of on the fringe, that's maybe not hanging with the with the. The, the rest of the pack that is not involved in the process of, of creating security by the safety in numbers and the encouraging aspect of it, and they've drifted off to the back of the pack and they kind of got their head down and they're not paying any attention and they're kicking rocks and grumbling before the Lord, and all of a sudden, the pack's way down the road. And here comes the lion. And that wildebeest goes, rut row. And they may or may not make it back. They may or may not make it back. But this is the reason why there is to be such encouragement, why there is such safety in, in this place, in the, 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 the fellowship that we have in the Lord, because we're able to take and see those that are in need of maturing, those that are in need of nurturing, come back to the place to be strong enough that not only can they run with the pack, but they can help others to do the same. It's amazing just how real the struggle is as soon as we come to Christ. It's interesting when I'll pray with somebody and they'll accept the Lord and you just see that instant release of that burden of sin and they accept and they receive and they've got this, this joyous look on their face and they realize and they recognize that the thing that they've been looking for their entire life has now entered into it. That place in their heart that was empty is now full and they know that there's hope for the future and they have to stop and go, but let me tell you what's going to happen next. <laughs> what do you mean? This is great. This is wonderful. I love everybody and everybody loves me. No, they don't. No, they don't. You see, before you came to the Lord, you were just kind of like cruising as part of the nebulous crowd. Now that you are in the Lord, there is a light that has shined right on you and to you and through you by Jesus Christ, which has made you a beacon, like a lighthouse in the middle of the storm that is spinning around and broadcasting to the enemy. Here I am! Come get me! And a lot of folks, when they're new to the Lord, you try to tell them these things, you try to make them understand it's important that you stay in the Word every day. It's important that you pray every day. It's important that you stay in fellowship. You need to be here every time the doors are open. You need to find somebody that you can attach to that can be a mentor. You need to ask questions. You need to stay engaged. And they're like, but why? I feel great. You go, you are the young wildebeest. And guys, we have to recognize and we have to understand the necessity and the need to help those that come to the Lord in that situation to be nurtured, to be mentored, to be strengthened, to be brought along into this, this place to where not only do they become a part of the healthy organism, the healthy body of Jesus Christ, but they are able then to do the same for others. I've seen far too many people come to the Lord and three weeks later, and you've seen it. It's like it never happened. Things got a little bit rough. Man, I, I didn't realize I had problems. But here's the thing. If you recognize opposition, if you recognize things coming against you, we need to be able to strengthen them by saying, this is the evidence that there's an enemy that's out after you. The very thing you didn't see, the very danger that you didn't recognize, the very 
peril that was upon you on a daily basis that was leading you in separation of God and to a, an eternal separation is the very thing now, the weight of that on you and what you are seeing now. How many of you woke up with a new spiritual set of eyes and went, whoa, I had no idea that there was all this going on in the spiritual realm. Then the Holy Spirit comes by and He starts showing you things and you're like, whoa. This is real. This is battle. This isn't, this isn't happy thoughts and pixie dust. This is, this is the reality of, of that which is of God and that which is of the enemy. And the enemy seeking as a roaring lion would to destroy that which God has started and what Christ has created within you. So guys, this is serious. We have to recognize. We have to realize. And it's so important. The struggle is real. To stir up each other in love and in good works. In verse 35, do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Yet, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Not, or now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back. Say amen. amen. To, perdition, to perdition. But of those who believe to the saving of the soul. We're not those that are going to draw back. We're going to be those who are going to continue to stir up love, to continue to stir up good works, to continue to encourage one another. Rather than consoling someone, encourage them rather than thinking that oh my goodness this is the worst thing that could possibly happen and we need to we need to take and just just totally fall apart no we don't i don't see anywhere in the word of god that it says that in him falling apart is okay you with me oh yes we're supposed to console those we're supposed to mourn with those that moan we're supposed to cry with those that cry we're supposed to rejoice with those that re absolutely we need to be relatable but the one that we're relating to hasn't said, oh my goodness, yeah, this is a situation where all is lost. You need to feel really bad. No, what I see in Scripture given to us is a place where it says that in all things that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Amen? We don't have to be concerned that at any point in time that He that is faithful to provide to us this, this presence of God, this ability to live and this ability to walk in, the, in His presence in the Holy of Holies is ever going to fail. Yet for a little while, and he is coming, will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. One last thought, and we'll close with this. Jesus is coming soon. I believe that. I believe that Jesus can come at any moment. I don't believe that there's anything prophetically, there's anything in Scripture, there's anything on the physical earth that has to happen in order for him to make his presence known, to, to call his church out of here and to return for it. I don't believe anything else has to happen. But I believe that because we're still here and it hasn't happened up to this particular moment, it's because he still desires that none should perish and that we, his church, would take then the message of the gospel to a lost and dying world. That's why we're still here. But we're not to be those that would look upon this reality and not recognize that there is this aspect of it being just a little while. The first half of my life, I spent trying to make things happen faster. You know what I'm talking about? Wanted to get my first car faster. Wanted to have that good job faster. I wanted to have that nice home faster. Right Now that I'm on the second half, I'm trying like crazy to slow everything down. <laughs> it's amazing how quickly it's going now and how slow it went in the beginning. It's just a while it's just as a matter of fact in, in in james 4 and verse 13 it tells us that we're not supposed to be concerned about tomorrow because tomorrow is going to happen but the reality is is that what we're living right now this life is just a vapor it's a vapor it's like steam leaving off of a of a, of a kettle of boiling water it's just and it's gone but 
But within that vapor, we can live our lives knowing that we have total access to God. Every single day, practicing living in His presence. Guys, there's nothing that can defeat you. There's nothing that can come against you. There's nothing that is more powerful than the God that has sacrificed Himself to save you. And we get to live in that. And not only do we get to live in it, but we get to influence the world around us with the same power that He has given to us. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank You.